Welcome to McNabb Pond in Custer Gallatin National Forest Sioux Ranger District. Here we have pretty much a hidden pond area surrounded by ponderosa pine trees. You can hear a bunch of different birds. We even have a bunch of berry bushes along the way here. This is a beautiful area out about eight miles outside of Ekalaka, Montana. And we have some incredibly dark skies here. I'm excited to share them with you. McNabb Pond is a pristine haven for all kinds of different wildlife. It also provides natural splendor that we don't get to quite see as close to a city. Being just outside the light dome of Ekalaka, we get incredibly dark skies here in McNabb Pond. This part of Montana is notable for having some of the last dark skies in the country as urban sprawl and neglect of sustainable lighting instruments has let light pollution run rampant across the nation. Let's zoom into Montana to see what makes it so special. Most of the state is covered in darkness. The darkest color you see here is the darkest sky you can possibly see. As we zoom into southeastern Montana, you'll notice that Billings is pretty much the only bright spot with a lot of dark sky filling our surrounding area. Last night we talked about Medicine Rock State Park, but notice that it's in a lighter gray area. That means it's in number two of our Bortles scale, meaning it could have darker skies, but still shows us the Milky Way. Here at McNabb Pond, we have the darkest possible skies that we can have on the Bortles scale. This means that we get to see the Milky Way in extreme detail, and that there are so many stars that it almost creates just background noise. Our other two star parties this summer, Atlantis Springs Campground and Capitol Rock, will both be in this same extremely dark sky, preserving some of the darkest skies in the entirety of the country. Let's explore what you can do to help keep dark skies in your area. This diorama represents your average scene in Ekalaka, a bunch of dinosaurs hanging out under streetlight, right? We can't see much detail because there's too much glare from our giant street light. Imagine this is a really bad neighbor who's shining really bright lights and keeping you up all night. Why don't we try adding a shield so that way we can focus this light on exactly what we want to see. Now our tiny pterosaur is visible. Our focus is perfect and we can see only it in detail. Our neighbors aren't angry because they aren't in light like they are now. They get to sleep well because they have this nice shielded light that only focuses on what we want to see. There are a number of things that you can do to help reduce light pollution in your own area. We just explored shielding and how that affects the focus of what we see and the politeness to our neighbors with light trespass. Another thing we can look at is temperature. You know those LED lights everyone's been talking about? Well, not only are they bright, but they also increase the amount of light pollution in certain areas, depending on the color of light. Those bright white and blue LEDs that you hear about in your phone screens and computer screens, they're still keeping you up all night. So a better way to reduce light pollution and help you maintain your good circadian rhythm is to dim that color a little bit, make it more amber. That color is much less harsh on your eye. and It'll be much better overall yourself and for the environment. Intensity is next on our list. If you don't need super bright lights, don't get them. Sometimes when lights are too bright, the glare actually does more harm than good by making what you want to see less visible due to glare. Not only is this safer and help you see things more clearly, but it can also reduce your electric bill. That goes into this next one, timing. If you don't need lights on at a certain hour, don't have them on. That way we can just have less lights overall and we can save more dollars instead of shining light on useless things that don't need to be lit up. Not only are these techniques safe and healthier for the environment, but they can save you and any other company or town a lot of money in the long run. Take a look at the lights that you have at home and see what you can do to help reduce light pollution. Now let's take a tour of what you can find stargazing. You can give it a try yourself by trying to find the same shapes and objects from home. 
Tonight, I'll be using two programs to help show you all the night sky. The first is Stellarium, a free software that replicates the night sky in great detail. The second will be Worldwide Telescope, another free online program that has solid detail on deep space objects. If you want to continue searching, you can try out both of these free programs at home. Let's get started stargazing. Can we see any stars? Eh, not really. However, there is one big star in our way, the sun. The sun's light is scattered in our atmosphere, which blocks out the other stars during the daytime. Since it has such high energy in its direct beams during the daytime, the light we see in the sky is blue. Now in the Stellarium, I have the power over time and space, so I'll set that sun. Oh look, there's Venus. Let me clear some of this stuff out of the way so we can see better. Now you can find Venus tonight looking out in the western sky. It will set just after sunset, and uh, it looks like Mercury will be following along as well. Mercury and Venus should be visible in the western sky around 75 minutes after sunset. Make sure you get outside to check them out. And they'll set earlier over the next week or so until they set, so get out soon. You don't need a telescope to see Venus. It's the brightest object in our night sky besides the moon, and it won't twinkle. Remember, twinkle, twinkle, little star, not twinkle, twinkle, little planet. Mercury should be easy to find as well, but a pair of binoculars may help you out. Let's visit these guys later, so we'll move forward. As the sun sets, we should start to see more and more stars. So many stars that some of it just appears as background noise for our eyes. Can you connect any of the stars to make shapes? Ancient people connected the dots to tell their stories in what we call constellations. Looks like there are some stars that are moving up there too. Ah, those must be satellites. Uh, why don't we zoom in on one? How about this bright one? This one will pass over our northern sky just after sunset. Why don't I bring up all the rest of the constellations for us, so we can get a bigger picture of our night sky. These shapes in the stars represent stories, mostly from the Greeks and Babylonians. Their stories are good for helping us wayfind in the night sky, but you can imagine the shapes in any way that is helpful for you. Whatever you see that helps you remember the shapes in the stars is what matters most. Here's what the Greeks saw in the night sky. What do you see? A dragon? A lion? A swan? There's so many things to imagine in our night sky. Why don't we start with this really big one right here? It's called Ursa Major, the Big Bear. It is famous for having the Big Dipper inside of it. The Big Dipper is not a constellation. Instead, it's called an asterism, or unofficial constellation. The Big Dipper has many different names to different people. Some see it as a plow, a casserole dish, a big wagon, a salmonette. And oddly enough, a number of people saw it as a bear. The Greeks put the head on the side where my cursor is now, but some native people put it on the other side at the very top there. We can use the Big Dipper inside the bear to find the North Star. Use these two stars at the bottom of the Big Dipper to point across the sky until you reach Polaris, this star at the end of the tail of Ursa Minor, the little bear. Polaris sits directly above the North Pole, so it never moves to us and always points north. The Greeks say that Zeus threw these bears into the night sky to save them from being hunted. Now, all of these stars within this circle are what we call circumpolar. That means these stars never set. They will always be in our northern sky, including Ursa Minor, the little bear, and Draco the dragon. Draco is a fierce dragon that surrounds the little bear. In Arabic myth, it is seen as two mother camels protecting a baby from two hyenas. The Greek myth sets Draco as the guardian of a tree with golden apples, in this case the little dipper. And Hercules has to retrieve the golden apples as one of his labors to becoming a god. 
Hercules will be directly overhead tonight. He'll be right around here. Now, Hercules wasn't the nicest of guys, though. I like to think of him as a super jock. <laughs> More like Jercules. <laughs> See, he uses his harp here, Lyra, to put Draco to sleep. He then steals all the golden apples and kills Draco for no good reason. The goal was to get the apples, not kill the dragon, you jerk. Ugh. Let's circle back to Lyra and its relationship to Polaris. Vega is the brightest star in Lyra, and it's the fifth brightest star in our night sky. While Polaris is the North Star today, in 8,000 years, Vega will be the North Star in our night sky. Next in our northern sky is Cassiopeia. She is the queen of ancient Ethiopia and appears as this W in the night sky. You can find her by following those north pointer stars to look opposite from the Big Dipper. Since they are both up every night of the year, it's a reliable way to find the W of Cassiopeia. The queen is supposed to be sitting on a throne with her head all the way up top here. Lucky for her, she sits right in the sky next to her husband, King Cepheus. Cassiopeia is punished for saying she was prettier than one of Poseidon's daughters. Now Poseidon almost ransacked all of their kingdom with a giant sea monster because of this, but luckily they were saved by Perseus. For her punishment, Cassiopeia spends half of the year upside down in the sky. Well, that about does it for this part of the sky, so why don't we move towards the south to see some more of our seasonal stars. Before we get too far, I'll point out what is left of our winter constellations. Here's Capella, the brightest star in Auriga the Charioteer, and the Gemini twins, Castor and Pollux. These stars are part of the Winter Circle, an asterism like the Big Dipper that contains many of the brightest stars in our night sky, including Orion and Taurus. As we look to the south, we are viewing our seasonal sky. These are the stars that change over the course of our year. Currently in our spring sky, there are lots of interesting constellations to explore. Now let's get started with our zodiac signs. The zodiac constellations are the ones that fall in the path of the sun, so they are eclipsed by the sun as the earth revolves in orbit. You may know your zodiac sign, but don't go looking for it on your birthday, or you'll be looking directly into the sun and that's not safe. Now wait six months after your birthday and you should be able to see your zodiac sign in the night sky. Currently, we can see Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpius, and part of Sagittarius. First up is Leo the Lion, the Herald of Spring. Leo is a great lion with impenetrable skin. That jerk Hercules has to fight this lion and ends up wrestling him into submission, claiming his pelt as an armor reward. Think of him in profile, like the Sphinx. He's lying down. Ah. I know, all my jokes are terrible. <laughs> Now let's take a look at the brightest star in Leo. Regulus is the heart of the lion, and like a heart has four chambers, there are four stars in the star system, called double binary. The next zodiac is Virgo, the beautiful maiden. Her head is up here, she has large wings, and carries a grain of wheat called Spica. Spica is one of our brightest stars in spring, and I'll show you how to find it. We need another constellation for help, though. Above Virgo is Boides, the herdsman, and his bright star Arcturus. He kind of looks like an ice cream cone. He's often seen as driving the plow, another name for the Big Dipper. Using the Big Dipper's handle, you can find the bright star Arcturus inside of Boides. I like to say it like this. You can arc to Arcturus and speed on down to Spica. When Spica sets in the west, that meant it was time for, to harvest the crops, making Virgo the goddess of the harvest. Next up is Libra, the Scales of Justice. This dim constellation is not the easiest to find. This is the only zodiac that is an inanimate object. These two stars uh, to the left were once the claws of Scorpius, the great scorpion next door. However, it would have made things out of balance. Uh, Scorpius will be full later in the summer, but Ophiuchus above him can be seen in his entirety. Ophiuchus is a doctor holding two snakes, believe it or not. 
the snakes tell him the secret to eternal life. He is technically the newest Zodiac since his knee cuts into the path of the sun. So now there are 13 Zodiacs. Though we can't see him quite yet, Sagittarius is right next door, where we'll be able to find Saturn and Jupiter in the summer. Right here in this spot is where the center of our galaxy is, where the supermassive black hole driving our galaxy sits. Well, we've made it through some of the brightest and most famous constellations that we can see in our night sky. I hope you get a chance to get out there and look up yourself to see what you can find from home. Now we'll go live to our telescopes viewing Mercury and Venus in conjunction. It's about 20 minutes after sunset. We're looking just about west. You see that one super, super bright object in the sky. It is not twinkling. That there is Venus. It will appear incredibly bright to your naked eye, but not the brightest in my camera here. Even if we zoom in, See how bright it still is. I'm gonna try and get a little bit of footage of it in the telescope to see if we can catch it and Mercury. I'm starting out by lining up my telescope using my finder scope. And within my finder scope alone, I can already see Venus and Mercury in pretty good detail. It's so rare to have them within the same shot. That's what really makes this event special is that Venus and Mercury are so close. Conjunction means two or more planets can be traced within a line they are so close. We are lucky that this conjunction can be seen with the naked eye. Here is my telescope on the prairie with Venus off in the distance. Now I'll zoom into my finder scope so you can see what I'm talking about. There. Now you can see both planets easily within this finder scope. Let's zoom out to show you the horizon once more. Venus has been putting on a show for months. It is the brightest object in our night sky next to the moon. Oddly enough, it is only in a crescent phase and is still the brightest object that we can see next to the moon. Mercury and Venus both show phases unlike any other planet that we see in our night sky. This helped people understand that Earth is the third planet from the Sun, with Venus and Mercury closer to the Sun. Here I have Mercury in a yellow filter, and notice it's starting to creep up in the screen, right? Well, Mercury isn't moving, at least not that much, nor is my telescope moving. It's locked in place. What's going on here? The Earth is spinning. We're capturing the spin of the Earth within the movement of this planet. This is what makes planetary observing so difficult. You have to always chase after the planets while trying to observe them at the same time. Let's move over to Worldwide Telescope so we can observe these planets further. Yesterday we looked at Mercury in pretty close detail. But today, we're going to move over to Venus to explore what makes it such a brilliant thing to view in our night sky. As we zoom in on Venus, you'll notice its brilliant yellow-orange atmosphere, mostly comprised of carbon dioxide and sulfuric acid, giving it that yellow color. Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system, with a surface temperature of over 850 degrees Fahrenheit. There haven't been any long-term successful missions to the surface of Venus. Only two failed attempts by Russian landers, both of which melted after 4 and 11 minutes of broadcasting data, respectively. Venus is so hot because all of the greenhouse gases trap the sun's heat within its atmosphere. Venus has a very odd rotation. Its year lasts about 225 Earth days, but its rotation, or one day, on Venus is 243 Earth days. It spins that slow. Also, it spins in the opposite direction of Earth and most all of the other planets in our solar system. Now let's head back to the museum and do a little bit of an experiment with ultraviolet light. 
you've ever been to the museum, I'm sure you know exactly where I am right now. We're staring at the wall of our building, the petrified wood inside the dark room. Our dark room has black lights and UV lights to excite rocks, fossils, and other minerals to then have them release visible light in a new wavelength. These minerals over here don't normally glow during the daytime, but when they're excited by ultraviolet light, they do. Ultraviolet light is a light from the sun that we can't see. That light is a little bit more higher energy. It's the same light that gives you sunburns as well. So, this kind of light can help us view things in a new way we had never seen before. Some animals can see into the UV spectrum. Maybe even dinosaurs could. Now you see that these fossils here, a lot of them glow orange. Orange fossils tend to have a lot of calcite in them, and it tends to be in their teeth. Let's take a look at this Oreodon jaw. You can really see its teeth are glowing vibrant orange. That's because teeth are made of hydroxyapatite, which is a, a calcium-rich mineral. Now when that becomes a rock or a mineral, since there's so much calcium, it becomes calcite. And calcite glows under ultraviolet light. That's the same for all of the other fossils that we see here. They're glowing orange with rich calcite. Even this one here. All of these fossils that we see here, these are some oligocene fossils that we tend to find in like Badlands National Park or uh, the Finger Buttes out here in Ekalaka and in Carter County. Some other fossils that glow can be like these, like these teeth here, these are Mosasaur teeth found in the county. You can also find things like Mastodon teeth and Mammoth teeth. They tend to glow as well. Now, something special about this Mastodon tooth, it's a baby Mastodon tooth, and the reason it glows so strongly is because it's covered in a shellac, a glue, that is also fluorescent. Now, there's a difference between fluorescence and phosphorescence. Everything you see in here is fluorescent, meaning it releases light directly when hit by ultraviolet light. Some rocks and minerals, however, are phosphorescent. That means that they retain that energy and release light over a longer period of time. So if I turn these lights off, some of these rocks would still glow, even though there is no more light hitting them. We also have some eggshells here. These eggshells tend to glow as well. They're also rich in calcium, glowing that orange that we see in calcite and other calcium-rich minerals. Well, that's all we have time for today in our virtual star party at McNabb Pond. I want to send a big thank you to the International Dark Sky Association Montana chapter for being co-hosts on this video. And with that, get outside and look up.